Mm, not good. <laughs> Hello friends, my name is Brandon Dayton, I'm your humble narrator, and welcome back to another Bundle Banter. This would be the humble choice for May 2020, and if you are into strategy games, you are totally in luck this month. If you are not into strategy games, uh, <laughs> you might be pretty disappointed with the picks. So let's go ahead and have a look at them. For May 2020, we've got Jurassic World Evolution, XCOM 2, Rise of Industry, Niche, a genetic survival game, Warhammer 40k Gladius, The Swords of Ditto, Mormo's Curse, Warsaw, Heave Ho, M.O. Astray, Neoverse, Chess Ultra, and Horus. As for the bonus game from last month, if you were subscribed, everybody got Train Valley 2, which is kind of a nice casual resource management train building game. Not a whole lot to say about it, but I got a whole lot to say about all of these games. I probably went a bit too verbose, but hopefully that won't make the video too much longer than it needs to be. So, without any further ado, let's take a look at these games. Jurassic World Evolution! This is actually a game that I did for my channel already, along with Dino Park Tycoon. I enjoy park management, but when you throw dinos into the mix, you have just discovered my secret sauce. Genetic manipulation in this game is fun, and it allows you to customize your dinos to some degree. The voice acting really lets you get a feel for the characters and their motivations. It even features the amazing vocal stylings of the one and only, uh, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> You can focus on any of the three branches in your park, those being science, security, or entertainment, and each one has some distinct advantages. Balance your power grid and your guest happiness. It's really standard park management fare, but it just feels so good. So good, in fact, that I found myself more than once just taking the jeeps out for joy rides around the park, just to take some pictures of the carnivore, then heading over to chase critters around the herbivore enclosure. The tutorial in this game can feel a bit overwhelming for newcomers to the genre, but of course, I took to it like a duck to water, mostly because I swim every single day. <laughs> the repetitive nature of this game might get to you eventually, which is why the series abruptly ended on my channel, but it's the nature of the beast in this genre, I think. There's plenty of things to keep working towards. Finally, I should probably mention that this game comes with one piece of DLC that adds six dinosaurs to the park. I love Frontier Developments, but my god, their last few titles have gone heavy on the DLC. That might be a negative for some, but I personally don't mind cruising around the park knowing that there's not every single dinosaur present in my version of the game. I just enjoy what is there, but I know that it might drive some completionists nuts. XCOM 2 We had the 2K Play Together bundle not too long ago. I covered it. Well, I think 2K was holding out on us. They return with the sequel to the greatest strategy game I've ever had the pleasure of playing. There's just so much heart and attention to detail packed in here that you'll never find yourself bored. Of course, I've rage quit a fair amount of times, and even rage uninstalled when the power of percentages make themselves known. Seriously, how did I miss 10 times with an 80% chance to hit? Ugh. But I always find myself coming back time and time again to try and save the Earth from the alien scourge through the power of sheer strategy. There are a huge range of skills and abilities for the humans and the aliens alike. I've never had any of my playthroughs feel exactly the same, even if my squad is stomping through the same level as the previous 10. With the ability to play online and even the magic of the modding community at work here, you can bet that XCOM 2 will keep you busy for basically however long you require it to do so. The DLC included in this bundle, if you pick XCOM, is the Reinforcement Pack, which actually consists of three separate DLCs, Anarchy's Children, Alien Hunters, and Shen's Last Gift. Anarchy seems to be a mostly cosmetic bundle, and they're not really that great cosmetics in my humble opinion. It's mostly like punk rock stuff, which I guess is okay, but doesn't really fit into the XCOM universe. Alien Hunters add some special boss fights, which is cool. And there's also a host of new equipment that is super powerful, but it feels a bit thematically confused, like why am I using fantasy flintlocks in a sci-fi game, you know? You got fantasy in my sci-fi type of deal. <laughs> Shen's last gift is absolutely the strong horse here, because it offers a new mech class called the Spark, and it has a whole new set of abilities. It is a lot of fun. I'm definitely looking forward to clocking some more hours into XCOM 2. Rise of Industry. 
a very involved blend of strategy and management. You'll start with a little train line, and then you expand it into an empire through smart investment and execution. Source your raw materials, and produce ever more complex products in order to send them to market and generate a profit. One of the things I like most in this game is just the detail. Every step of the way carries its own costs. The goods don't magically fly to market. You'll need to set aside some money to transport it. How about factory upkeep? Did you consider this, that, or the other? Rise of Industry is the kind of game that will keep you on your toes the entire time. You might think that the cutesy aesthetic means that things will be a cakewalk, but the depth of this game will brutalize you mercilessly. Luckily, you can adjust the difficulty settings rather easily. The only negative about this game, really, is the barebones tutorial and a severe lack of UI information. You can absolutely find the information that you need, but getting to it can be a bit more cumbersome than it really needs to be. Given enough time, or a couple of YouTube tutorials, you'll start getting a feel for the game and its flow. There are a lot of people that will be scared away long before this point, but if you persevere, you'll be met with one of the most rewarding indie gaming experiences that I've had in a long time. There is no prescribed set of rules to follow, You'll just need to adjust to whatever situation you're in, and adapt to survive in the market. Much like the real world, it's rather sink or swim, and I love that. If you're a fan of turning numbers into bigger numbers, and I'm a YouTuber, so you know I am, <laughs> then Rise of Industry is sure to please. Niche! Turn-based genetic survival game? It is about as awesome as it sounds. Granted, there are a huge amount of plates that you'll need to keep spinning, but that's all part of the fun. My very first playthrough, I ended up breeding my creatures too closely together, and I wound up with a bunch of inbred sickies that starved to death. Though the inbreeding isn't always an insta-death, inbreeding can also present some valuable immunity genes against certain diseases. The genetic system is super deep, and I always love seeing what my new little baby critter will turn out looking like. Almost any part of the body can be manipulated, and each type of that body part usually carries some sort of pro or con. To add to this complexity, Dominant and dormant genes are a big factor. Even quote-unquote bad creatures can carry some useful dormant genes. On the downside, your creatures die fairly quickly. After the first few, I stopped trying to create the perfect specimens and just focused on the bigger picture, which is, of course, survival of the species. The gameplay loop is kind of repetitive, and some traits are downright crippling. Like, okay, example. If you're breeding for a creature that has a strong sense of smell and hearing, well, you might end up with a blind baby. The blind trait prevents the creature from moving at all, unless another creature's next to it. I'm pretty sure that isn't how blindness works. Let me navigate my blind critter! Although, that could end up poorly as well, because Niche saves after every single move. Accidentally misclicked your pack alpha into the water? Too bad, he's dead forever. It's another super unforgiving strategy game, that won't necessarily appeal to everyone, but it certainly vibes with my personal taste. I have a lot of respect for Strayfon Studios, because with every game that they make, they take a lot of risks, and I appreciate that. Warhammer 40k Gladius Every time I'm sure that I have every single Warhammer 40k game, another one just seems to crawl out of the woodwork. It's certainly more a blessing than a curse, however, because I friggin' love these games! <laughs> Gladius features four races, that all manage to feel and play uniquely. Plenty of people compare it to Civilization, but this is a 4X that focuses a lot more on the combat side of things. If you prefer playing politics, then this game probably won't please you, but if you're in it just to bludgeon your opponents into a fine powder, yeah, you'll probably be pretty pleased with this entry. The combat-heavy nature of Gladius means that you can attain victory within a few hours, instead of being locked into the same game for weeks at a time before one side or another manages to win. I have Vietnam-style flashbacks of the Civ 5 game on a large Earth map with 8 opponents, and that game took more than 80 hours to finish. So it is so nice to sit down with something that I know can reach a conclusion in less than 5 hours. While I have a soft spot for Warhammer, I still think that Age of Wonders did the Fantasy 4X a bit more justice, but if you lean towards something more sci-fi, then Gladius was tailor-made for you. Unfortunately, none of the DLC is included here, and there is quite a bit to pick up if you're so inclined. I'm super tempted by the two DLC factions that are offered, but I'd need to put a lot more time into Gladius in order to justify the purchase to myself. Overall, it captures the tabletop game feeling that Warhammer games are so renowned for, and if you're a fan of strategy games, 
then this one is certainly worth giving a spin for at least a round or two. Swords of Ditto! Holy hell. This this one isn't a strategy game. Did, did they make a mistake? No, Swords of Ditto is an action roguelike that ended up being somewhat of a flop for multiple reasons. But first the good! Cute art style, excellent sound work, well-designed puzzles and bosses. It also offers a ton of fun if you can loop somebody in to play as your co-op partner, but I guess that can be said for just about any game with multiplayer capability. Games are always more fun with someone you enjoy spending time with, duh. So yeah, anyways, <laughs> Sword of Ditto seems set for success with all of those factors, but it never quite made it into the spotlight. Why? Well, the combat is far too simple to feel satisfying. The difficulty factor also just isn't there. When I study roguelikes that give me that special tickle, they're all fast-paced with satisfying combat that allows for a degree of mastery. Swords of Ditto feels like it takes away all skill-based combat and replaces it with just a grind. This makes the game lean much harder into the RPG genre, which I don't mind, but periodically your level will get too high or time will run out and you'll just be forced into the boss dungeon. This takes away a huge amount of player agency, and when it happens you're just like, well, okay, time to go die again. So then you die, and you sit through the entire cutscene of getting your sword and such all over again. Well-built roguelike games will drop you right back into things within seconds. Swords of Ditto seem to have missed that memo. It feels like a slog, and you really get nothing for finally completing the game. On top of that, variety is extremely limited in everything from the enemies to the dialogue. On paper, this game should have been right in my wheelhouse. In practice, it was a severe letdown. Warsaw. A turn-based roguelike set during the Warsaw Uprising. The first thing that jumped out at me was the darkest dungeon-style graphics. While this game doesn't quite hold a candle to the roguelike that inspired it, there's definitely something to it. It conveys war without the filter of heroism that most media tends to apply. Warsaw will make you feel things. The first time you recruit a child soldier, it will probably hit you. Watching one of your soldiers play with toy trains after a battle, in their spare time, can make you consider the cost of any necessary risks that you might decide to take. The game is set on a timeline, similar to Swords of Ditto, except that once it ends, it's really over. It's generally a short game, but you won't experience all of the content in just one playthrough, so I'd suggest diving back into the breach as it were, if you can stomach it. Outside of the amazing narrative power and art style, the actual mechanics of the game are pretty great. What other turn-based game lets you run the risk of running out of bullets during a boss fight? The combat isn't overly complex, but there are a handful of combos and skills that you can combine to great effect. It isn't all combat, of course. You can also craft items and assist surrounding districts to boost their morale and prevent them from surrendering to the Nazi forces. This is the kind of game that will absolutely brutalize you. You aren't supposed to make it to the timeline cutoff that counts as the end of the adventure. If you do, then you've managed to overcome the odds. While I'd like to see more content added, I'm extremely satisfied with the inclusion of Warsaw in this bundle. Heave ho! Local cooperative, fun with physics type of game, where your one and only goal is to swing to the end of the level using the hands and bodies of your friends. The more people you have, the better. Even if you're forced to sit and play this game by yourself like a true blue lonely boy, it's still a decent amount of fun. I'd love for this game to implement official multiplayer, but it doesn't. At the moment there are still a few workarounds that aren't completely awful, so you might take advantage of those. The control scheme can take a while to get used to, but I think that's to be expected, as this is definitely sort of a derp game that thrives on you having no idea how to perform the task at hand. Given just a few minutes, the gamers and non-gamers in the household will be on even footing, which is extremely conducive to having those non-gamers come back and play again. There's so much potential that has yet to be met here, but I guess I just have to wait with bated breath that someday they will implement things like workshop support, extra modes and levels, and of course the aforementioned multiplayer functionality. The game is definitely short, but you will have a blast every single time you boot it up. The only real downsides are the fact that you absolutely need a controller in order to play. If someone shows up without a controller, they're shit out of luck. And if they have a Steam controller, well, Evo can be a little bit wonky with certain configurations. Finally, the game might insist on starting in windowed mode, but that's a super easy fix. Hit Alt plus Enter. 
overall, I think this is a great entry into this bundle for people who might not be enjoying the landslide of strategy games that we got this month. MO Astray. Side-scrolling action platformer with some very interesting mechanics, namely the ability to stick to everything from walls to enemies. While you start out relatively unable to do anything, aside from the aforementioned sticking, you will of course gain new powers as the game progresses. But I'll be honest, the sticky power is my favorite one of all. Stick to an enemy's head and lovingly guide them into a machine that will crush or grind them apart. Eventually, you can use your dash while sticking to the enemy's head to simply decapitate them on the spot. This game is absolutely gorgeous, and despite the adorable protagonist, it does feature a certain level of gore. I always enjoy that kind of dichotomy in my games. Cute or colorful, plus gory or brutal. It's like an unexpectedly tasty combination. Like a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. I'm serious, try it. Unless you're allergic to peanut butter. But I digress. The enemies, bosses, and puzzles are well designed and keep things at a decent difficulty. I find that I'm able to blitz through large sections at a time, but eventually I'll just get stumped by one thing or another, so I sleep on it. And then when I end up coming back, it's like the answer was staring me in the face the entire time. The story is a little strange, as it's mostly told by poking through the memories of enemies while you're stuck to their head. The narrative does Tarantino around quite a bit, but eventually you will explore enough enemies' memories and the pieces will start to fall into place and you'll be able to discern what they were going for. I'm absolutely shocked that this game flew so far under the radar. It was released in October of 2019 and I hadn't even heard of it until this bundle, but now, <laughs> I can't think of anything else. Neoverse, do you like Slay the Spire? How about Slay the Spire with tits? <laughs> Neoverse is a deck-building roguelite that doesn't actually offer that much that other games haven't done better. Except for boobs. Can't forget the boobs. The nice part is that every card feels like it has at least some kind of purpose. There aren't really any filler cards in this game, which is satisfying. Also, whenever a card is played, you get to draw another until your energy is completely depleted. This obviously means that zero-cost cards have never looked better. You can also visit the shop at any time, which is nice even during combat. Finally, the skill trees don't feel completely useless. While it isn't as tooth-grindingly hard as something like Slay the Spire, that can be a plus depending on how you look at it. Sometimes I don't want to agonize over card choices. I just want to move things around on the screen and enjoy some jiggle physics. There are a few unique mechanics that bear mentioning as well. The first is the combo system. You'll be presented with 3-5 to five cards and rewarded with extra damage if you play them in the given order. Perfect block happens when you block for exactly the amount of damage that the enemy was attempting to hit you for. This stuns the enemy for a turn. Both of these mechanics help, but definitely don't make you feel like you're missing out on anything if you choose to ignore them. The last mechanic is where the rub is. Precision is a mechanic that awards 50 gold for defeating an enemy with exact damage. Not 1 HP more, not 1 HP less. This is difficult and wastes a lot of time. But, maximizing gold can be the difference between victory and failure in certain runs. Precision really ruins the overall pace of the game, and if you ignore it, then you are actually missing out. I think the game would be better off without it, personally. Overall, it's a decent deck builder, but I'll probably stick to playing Slay the Spire, personally. Chess Ultra. I mean, it's chess, bro. It's one of the oldest games on the planet, and for good reason. Is there a reason to play this over the chess game that comes pre-installed on almost every computer in existence? Well, I mean, that all depends on you. Do you feel the need to go head-to-head -head with some online opponents? Usually, I personally don't, because as much as I enjoy chess, I'm just really not that good at it. The servers are pretty barren most of the time, but having the option for online play is something that I can never knock too hard. The models are much prettier to look at, and it also comes with some soothing music. The AI in this game is legitimately Grandmaster level, and will totally knock you on your ass if you don't know what you're doing. Luckily there are also tutorials and the like that can kinda get you up to speed. On the downside, it bears mentioning that the slow animations can be a death sentence when you're battling against a timer during tournament play, but for the casual chess player like me, who just wants to be matched up with an AI or Maybe even a person if I'm feeling brave that's around my skill level. This is a decent place to go. 
It definitely needs a few more features in order to legitimately compete with even the most basic free chess software out there. You can't just set up specific positioning and play from there, for example. A game database would be a lot of fun too. Even just the ability to import PGN files would go a long way. There are online leaderboards in this game, but not much else. While it isn't the most impressive game that could have been included in this bundle, it isn't necessarily complete trash either. Or maybe I'm just being sentimental over a game that my dear grandfather used to pull out in order to crush my ego. Horus, 2D puzzle platforming love letter to past generations of gaming. I'm actually pretty pleased with the entire package of Horus. There are skills to unlock, secrets to discover, bosses to conquer, and the best part, they all feel like they have a purpose. While things start out with baby steps, you'll eventually be pushed to your limits with tests of pixel-perfect platforming. The storytelling is funny, soulful, and clearly deliberately silly. I'm not sure how well a game of this nature would speak to a younger generation, but for an old head like me, it takes me back to a somewhat simpler time and manages to journey through various genres and eras. There are also a few minigames to give you a little break from the platforming, and I think that adds a nice touch. The references are pretty heavy, which is great if you get them, but if you don't, well, they probably stick out like a sore thumb. The game is mostly linear, but right when you think you're getting to the end and things are winding down, the game throws an open world map into the mix. The story itself is a bit lackluster, but the character of Horus is so endearing that I can't help but be sucked in. Who doesn't love a child like Robot who's eager to learn more about his world? That kind of thing is infectious. Finally, the music and the art are absolutely gorgeous. Endearing and charming is the name of the game in Horus. If you haven't given it a try yet, then you absolutely need to. So, what do I think of this bundle as a whole? Hmm. It sort of feels to me like Humble is scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point, if you want me to be quite frank. One of the things that makes this bundle so weak is just how many games in it were given away somewhere else. Horus, for example, was given away by Epic Games at some point. Swords of Ditto and Heave Ho were both given away for free by Twitch. XCOM 2 was the headliner like three years ago. And very recently, Niche was a tier one game. Overall, I still think that the value is there. I will be purchasing this bundle, but I can understand why people would skip, especially if they're not into strategy games like I am. I think a lot of people will probably be dropping Chess Ultra as the very first one from this bundle. Probably also Niche, I assume a lot of people have that. Heave Ho might also have to go. Neoverse, Swords of Ditto, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff that could honestly probably go. I don't know how long this humble choice thing is going to last. They don't seem to publish statistics about just how many are sold, so we can only guess. But the general consensus I've seen this month is mm, not good. <laughs> it's not good. So while I think this has been unequivocally the worst humble choice that we've seen thus far, it isn't the worst humble monthly. I actually had a comment on last month's humble choice video by the lovely Gizmo Mogwai who pointed out that the Humble Monthly from July 2016 featured Hurt World, Kentucky Route Zero, TAS 100, and Satellite Rain. Very lackluster bundle. August 2016, Black Ops 3 multiplayer only, Jackbox Collection, Planet of the Eye, also a relatively forgettable bundle, so I have to have faith that eventually Humble Choice will come back around, but like I said, I do see the value in, in paying $12 and getting 10 games. What the hell? Where else are you gonna find that ever? and they're relatively decent games at that. No, they're not the toppest tier ever, most of them, but for the price, I mean, <laughs> they're a lot better than what you'll get on somewhere like Indie Gala. No shade, Indie Gala. <laughs> Fanatical still smashes Humble up as far as I'm concerned, but I still do enjoy Humble a lot, despite the relative lack of love that I have for this bundle. See, because the other bundles out there, they were so diverse. They had like a little bit of something for everybody. This is just like a load of different kinds of strategy games, which I don't think is a good way to go. I know a lot of people out there are pissed about it. But yeah, anyways, let me know your thoughts. I'm going to stop rambling here and get out of here. We're currently giving away this war of mine in the Discord, and Jurassic World Evolution is coming sometime next week. So if you want to get that, head on over to the Discord server. Link is in the description. Interact with the giveaway bot, and you will be entered to win. Also, follow me on Twitter, 
Holla on the Patreon. Big shout out to Damon Darkstar and Nico the Legend for supporting us on the Patreon currently. Like, comment, subscribe, sub. You know, you know the deal by now. Come on, man. <laughs> Anyways, this has been Humble Choice, May 2020. I've been Brandon Dayton, your humble narrator. With another bundle banter, I shall see you in the next one. And until then, friends. <laughs>